Father, we come to you today just asking that to be with the families of those who are mentioned this morning, those who have lost loved ones, for those involved in a traffic accident, and just uh, continue to, to put your hand on the ones that we have been praying for. And as always, we're thankful that we serve a God who listens. You're not on a throne far, far away, but you actually give us your spirit. We're so thankful for what you've done for us. We just pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So I have a gift I want to give to someone this morning. It says, uh, Certificate of Baptism. This is to certify that Hannah Bravely was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit at First Christian Church of Dyer. And under that it says, For as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, and has the date. So, Hannah, here you go. This is very nice. And, uh, it's my understanding that there are a few people who turn a, a year older this year. There's going to be a bit of a celebration of birthdays uh, later today. So I thought a birthday story would be appropriate. A boss was having a birthday. And so his employees got together and they got him a birthday present. And so when they gave the boss the birthday present, it was kind of wet over in one corner. And so he looked at it and he touched it, smelled it. And he says, is it a bottle of wine? He said, no, no, it's not a bottle of wine. So he reached down there again and touched it, smelled it. He said, oh, it's a bottle of scotch. He said, no, 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 it's not a bottle of scotch. So he reached down there, and this time he tasted it, he said, I just, what is it? They said, it's a puppy. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> so we're in the book of Ephesians. We're following. The art of following. We've been talking about it during the last two weeks of Ephesians. So we're going to kind of touch on Ephesians chapter 5 today. And then next we're going to go into Ephesians chapter 6. We've been talking about following, the art of following Jesus. And so Paul tells us in chapter 5, he tells us as he opens it up, he looks at it, and this is what it says. It says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Imitate God because... You are his dear children. There's three things I'm going to repeat over and over and over again. Number one is unity. Number two is humility. And the third thing I'm going to talk about over and over again is you are beloved by God. This word dear, right before the word children, is actually a word called agapitos. It's a derivative of the word agape. And it has a very strong meaning. The strong meaning is this. It means dearly loved. You are God's dearly loved. Secondly, you are well beloved. That's what this word means, agapitos. Well beloved. It also means greatly loved. And it means also dear to the heart. That's how you are to God. You are all of these things to God. Paul is not the only one to say this. James says this. John says this. Peter says this. And Paul also says this. They all use this word, agapotos, to describe you and I as being dearly loved by God. When Jesus was baptized, he was in the water, and when he came out, Jesus, uh, God said to him, This is my dearly, what? Beloved son. In him I am well pleased. The same word that used to describe Jesus is now used to describe you. And used to describe myself. Because that's who we are in Christ. We are now dearly loved. 
We are dear to the heart of God. We are greatly loved by Him. For God so loved the world, kind of, sort of, maybe. They kind of sent His Son down, and, and that maybe if, you know, if everything went right, that He would be crucified on the cross, because that day He kind of felt good about humanity, and He decided to go ahead and, and rescue them. Is that what it says? For God so loved you and I. This is the greatly love that we forget about. When we think about it, and I was talking with this a little bit about this to Mary Leah yesterday. When we think about our own children, we can say to them over and over and over again, I love you, 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 I love you. But the first time they mess up when you have scolded them, guess what you have to do? I love you again, right? Because they're feeling that sense of condemnation. They're feeling that sense of, I'm not worthy. They're feeling that sense of, maybe God, maybe my, my, my uh, mom and dad don't love me anymore because they just scolded me. They just got after me. We are dearly loved by God. And Satan will try and take that from you every chance he gets. He knows where my weakness is, my, my enemy does. My enemy knows that I struggle with the feeling of worthlessness, that I struggle with the feeling of unworthiness. He knows that. So he will often try to tell me, you're not worth it. You're not worthy. You're not good enough. That's what he tells me often. But I know when I open the scripture. Without fail, the scripture tells me, I am worthy. I am good enough. I am loved. I'm not just loved. I'm agapotos. I am dearly loved. I am greatly loved. I am dear to the heart of God. And so is every person in this world. You remember when we first opened the book of Ephesians? We found that when we said yes to God, it gave him great delight. Remember that? Way back in the, in the uh, first chapter, it just gave him great pleasure to call us his children. And now Paul tells us that we are his dear children. And as a result, he says in verse 2, because, therefore, because you are his dear children, because you are so dearly loved, here's what I want you to do, he says, Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us, and He offered Himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. I really love the way the message frames this. It says this, watch what God does, and then you'll do it. Like children, you must learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with Him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't live in order to get something from us, but to give everything of Himself to us. Love like that. What if Jesus would have just been Jesus on Saturday? What if Jesus would have been just Jesus at the synagogue? What if Jesus would have been just Jesus when everything was going well? What if Jesus would have just been Jesus in the temple? How would history reflect that? Would he have been our Savior? You see, Jesus walked among us. Emmanuel, he lived among us, he dwelled among us, he walked up to us and he touched us and he felt us and he cried with us, he lived with us, he did all of these things with us because that's who he is. He didn't hold anything back in his love for us. He gave us everything, everything, so that we could be drawn to Him. This is how we are to live. One of the regrets that I have in my life is that up to this point, well, up to a few years ago, I kind of held back. I didn't really give everything. I just kind of, well, I'm kind of in the game, but I'm not really in the game. Last night we went to the Railcats game, and there was a guy out playing right field. And a, and a couple of balls went out to him, and one of them kind of landed right in front of him. 
and it really upset me. He could have caught the ball. In a little bit of hustle, he could have got out there and caught the ball. There's a center fielder who, who dove for a ball and he caught it. This guy didn't show any hustle. He just kind of lollygagged up to it and kind of got it and threw the ball in. And then there was another one where the ball went out to him and it should have been an easy single, the most of a single. And because he was lollygagging up to the ball, the guy got a double. Throw the bum out. <laughs> but that's the way kind of we live life. Kind of, you know, kind of into it a little bit. Kind of, kind of, uh, you know, just we'll do church on Sunday and then Monday comes around. We'll kind of get back to our normal life and our normal business. What if Jesus had done that? What if he had lived a life like we live our lives? Paul says, don't live your life like that. Follow the example of Jesus. He gave of himself everything. He held nothing back. His love was extravagant. Look at all of the things that he did for us. He healed thousands of people. He turned tons of water into wine. He gave the, the guys huge amounts of, of fish. He turned two loaves and or five loaves and two fishes into 12 baskets full after he had fed everybody. It was extravagant. It was bold. It was, it was, it was for us to learn from. That's the kind of life that he wants us to live. Love like that. Love like Jesus loves. Then Paul goes on to say to us, I should say uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 3, Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Now Paul's beginning to lay it out for us. Therefore, because you are God's dearly loved children, you need to start acting like God's dearly loved children. Do you ever hear about Jesus going around and having sexual immorality? Not one time. Do you ever hear about Jesus being lazy and, 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 and uh, not giving his best? No. Do you ever hear about Jesus being greedy? No. He hung around those kind of people. He was there to save those kind of people. But, but that's not who he was. So if we follow his example, we don't find sexual immorality or impurity or greed among him. So therefore, it does not need to be among us. If we are following Christ, we're not pursuing these things. But here's the dilemma. Here's the dilemma. Remember last week I told you we we're going to get into the fruits of the Spirit a little bit. So we're going to move forward to Galatians, the fifth chapter. And we're going to pull out the dilemma. Paul says, I want you to live as dear children. But we got a problem. Let's see what the problem is. Verse 16 of chapter 5. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the Spirit or what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Anybody relate to that? <laughs> I want to do good, but I can't. I try to do good, but I end up doing bad. And the bad that I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. We find that in Romans, the seventh chapter. We've got this dilemma, this problem. Our sinful nature is struggling with our spiritual nature. God tells us through Paul, I, as dear children, I want you to have no sexual immorality. I don't want you to have any impurity. I don't want you to have any greed in your life. But that kind of goes against who we are. Who we are as this people. Let's go on and see what it says. But when you're directed by the Spirit, you're not under an obligation of the law of Moses. Man, one of these days I'm going to preach about the law. <laughs> one of these days I'm going to write about the law. I'm not going to get started on that today. So let's move on. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, these, the results are very clear. Here's what happens when we kind of do what we want to do. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Wow, what a list. <laughs> Thankfully, I've never done more than seven or eight of these things on that list. <laughs> That's kind of me. That's me right there he's talking about. That, that, that's who I am. That's what I fight with every single day of my life because that is what is my sinful nature. That's my physical nature. That's, that's who we really are. 
And, and he goes on to say, let me tell you again, as I've told you before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those are powerful words. Paul has given us a warning. You are his dearly loved children. We need to deal with these things. But here's the problem with that list. That problem with that list is that we like to point out the things that we see in other people. We like to berate the sexual immorality and the, and the impurity and the lustful pleasures and the, and, the, and the idolatry and the sorcery and the hostility, but the quarreling and the jealousy and the outbursts of anger and the selfish ambition and the decision of division and the envy, uh, we don't talk too much about those things. And we don't talk too much about the gospel. We don't talk too much about division. We don't talk too much about saying bad things, bad things about other Christians. We don't say things, we don't bring up the, the berating that we do about other Christians. But Paul puts that in the same list as sexual immorality, impurity, and lustful desires. As far as God is concerned, when you gossip about another Christian, that's the same as you going out having an affair. It's the same thing. And a lot of times it's more destructive. Because if you have an affair, you're sinning against yourself. But if you gossip about another Christian, you are sinning against the body of Christ. That's a pretty big deal. So watch what you say. So Paul gives us this list. Let me tell you again. If you're doing these things, you're not living in the kingdom of God. But he goes on to say this. But, verse 22... But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. You see the dilemma? The Spirit wants to bring us this, but our flesh wants to bring us the other. There's no law against these things. There's no law of Moses is what he's talking about. There's no law of Moses against these things. Not, not the law of the land. The law of Moses, keep it in context. So he finishes up with this. Those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their, of their sinful nature to the cross by crucifying them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. So Paul lays it out for us. He tells us, as his dear children, we are to live like dear children. We're to live like God. Not like the flesh, but, but like God. Like Christ, the example that we're trying to follow. Live like Him. But there's this dilemma going on, with this fighting between the flesh and the spirit. But God, through Christ, gives us the answer. How we can work this, how we can win this battle. What makes this battle possible? How can the Holy Spirit win this battle? Let's go to the secret of the soul. Open your Bibles and look at the 8th chapter. We're going to find the story of the parable of the sower. And this is going to be a powerful illustration for you today. And if you can get anything out of this message today, get hold of the secret of the soul. Let's go to the story. It says, one day... Jesus told a story in the form of a parable to a large crowd who had gathered from many towns to hear him. A farmer went out to plant his seed. And as he scattered it across his field, some of his seed fell on a footpath where it was stepped on and the bird ate. Other seed fell among the rocks and began to grow, but, but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up with it and choked out the, the tender plants. So other seed fell in fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. And when he said this, he called out, Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Look at the exclamation point at the end of verse 8. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. When you plant two little pieces of corn or three little uh, kernels of corn, you get out a big stock that gives out many times what was planted. But the apostles were just kind of like me. They were like, um, would you explain that a little bit? We're, we're not getting it. I, I love the apostles. They're so much like me. Uh, Lord, I'm not, I'm not getting it. Could you, could you kind of run over that for me? And so Jesus said, all right, fine. 
Let me, let me kind of explain this to you. So jump down to verse 11. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seeds that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only the devil comes to take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. So the message is given, but they don't receive it. So he goes on and talks about the second one. The seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. Yeah! Woo! Yeah, Jesus! Yeah, yeah, yeah! But in just a little short while, they don't have deep roots, and for a while they begin to fall away when, when they are faced with temptation. So Jesus goes on. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by all the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. Wow, that covers a lot of people. We get busy. The message is given to us. But we got our jobs, we got our kids, we got our bills, we got our marriage, we got grandkids, we got vacations, we got all of these things going on, and Christ gets choked out. He, he, he's, he, the, the message has been planted. We have great joy when we receive it, but we start putting our priorities in the wrong place, and pretty soon it gets choked out. So this battle continues. Verse 15. And the seed that fell on the good soil represents honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce what kind of harvest? Huge. Jesus uses the word huge, big, 100%, 100 times more than what we were given. A huge harvest. He's excited about giving us a huge harvest. But you see, I struggled with this parable for a long time. But what does this mean? Am I one of these seeds? Which, which one of these soils am I? Am I, the, am I the rocky or am I the, the, the one that got trampled out? Or am I getting choked out by life? But, but Jesus says at the end, good-hearted people who hear God's word cling to it and patiently produce a huge harvest. Well, how can I become that person? Here's the secret. You get to decide the soil you're going to be. The secret of this parable is you get to decide. You simply ask Jesus, Lord, I want to be fertile soil that produces a huge harvest. That's what I want to be. I want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy who struggles with my flesh. I don't want to be the guy who, who struggles with, with sexual impurity. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be this guy. I want to be this kind of servant for you. One that produces a huge harvest. But Jesus gives us the answer when he says in the previous verse, good-hearted, honest people. I get to choose that. And if I ask the Lord, Lord, make me that kind of person, then that's what he's going to do in my life. You see, we don't ask for that. We don't ask to, for the Lord to produce a huge harvest in us. We pray about a lot of things. But we don't often pray about this. We pray about, you know, we pray about our, our ailments or the ailments of other people. But do we pray, Lord, make me the kind of soil that produces a huge harvest? God gives us that option. We don't have to be the thorny ground. We don't have to be the stony ground. We don't have to be trampled out. We can be this, but you can't do it on your own because you're against the flesh. You ask the Lord of the harvest. He will make you this kind of soil. This is the kind of church we need to be. We need a church filled with people who says, Lord, I want to be a hundredfold Christian. I want to be a hundredfold believer. I don't want to be trampled out. I don't want to have my, my, my witness choked. I don't want to be in the newspaper. I don't want to be on the front page. I don't want to see Dyer on the front page because of trouble. I want to see Dyer on the front page because God is producing a huge harvest here. We can choose that. We can choose this soil if we say, Lord, I want to be this kind of believer. This morning as we wrap up 
these thoughts. Romans, the 12th chapter. If you open your Bibles there, I just kind of I want to hit this verse and we're going to wrap it up here. Romans, the 12th chapter. Paul sums it up for us. He says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you and give your bodies to God because He has done all for all that He has done for you. Let them be living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. Verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you think. King James Version says, by the renewing of your mind. See, when God begins to work in your life, He addresses this first. When you give Him this, He begins to address this. And until this is addressed, nothing else happens. Until you start planting into your mind the seeds that God can produce a good harvest out of, nothing's going to change. So I'm asking you this morning, what are you putting into your harvest field? What kind of debris is being passed in there? What kind of fertilizer are you putting in your field? The Bible tells us that God is not mocked. You reap what you sow. What are you putting into your field? Is it good things or is it weeds? Is it godliness or is it rocks? Transforming the, your mind is the key to the good harvest. Believing and thinking differently, and that only comes about by what you put in. Garbage in, what? Garbage out. Renewing our mind happens when we submit ourselves to the Lord and we begin putting ourselves things in our minds that are pleasing to Him. Whatsoever is good, whatsoever is just, whatsoever is a good report, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is pure, Paul says, think on these things. Philippians, the fourth chapter. What are you putting in your feet? You get to decide. Are you going to be choked out? Or are you going to be a massive harvest? I'm asking all of you to pray, Lord, make us this kind of person. Because we are His dearly loved children. Because He loves us so much. Because we are dear to His heart. Because He gave us extravagant love. Because He has given us grace. Because He has given us a new life. Because we are new creations, let us then live that way. Would you stand and we're going to pray and have the worship team come forward? Father, we get caught up in so much junk. We get caught up in things that just don't matter. <coughs> You want to do incredible things with our lives and we just we get caught up in some of the silliest things. We are let our hearts get troubled by, by things that you've already taken care of. You want to use our lives to shape the world, to mold the world, to change the world. And we get caught up in the thorns and the bristles and the rocks and the burdens of life. God, I repent for my own lack of judgment, my own lack of keeping my eyes on you. I want to be that kind of that kind of person that produces a hundredfold. And God, I know there's a room full of people here who feel the same way. They want to produce a hundredfold. They want to produce even more than that. If we submit ourselves to you, you will do that through us. Help us to submit. Help us to renew our minds with the things that you have for us, not for the things that we have for ourselves. Help us to submit to you. Help us to crucify ourselves. You are such an awesome, incredible, loving God. Help us to see that. In Christ, let me pray. Amen.
into this morning. And uh, I guess there's going to be some cake and ice cream and some other stuff to be the following the service. Yes, yeah, sir. Celebrate uh, your birthday. Hold on a minute, Karen. Uh, you know all the really cool people are born in August, right? Right. But, but you know, it's not only Sherry's birthday, and it's not only my birthday on the 22nd. There's also someone else in this room whose birthday is the 22nd. Shelly. And Cindy Starkey is also born the 22nd. She is out of town today, could not be here. So the really cool people are born August 22nd. <laughs> 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 Wait, 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 August 24th, that's close. <laughs> you know, you, you know, you're close for no cigar. <laughs> Thank you.